What's going on, everybody? Jeff Holiday here, and today we're going to be diving back into the world of Project Veritas. Now, for those of you who may have missed that video, uh, there is a link up here in the up there somewhere where you can click on it and watch it. But to refresh your memories, here's a quick little clip. What prompted me to do this was when I was house supervisor one night and one of my co-workers had taken the vaccine and she didn't want to. She had went throughout this entire pandemic working in the intensive care unit. She didn't want to take it. She didn't want to take it because of her religious beliefs. And she was coerced into taking it. Now, this was just the first whistleblower that was revealing the, the secrets of the whole COVID conspiracy and all the dangerous things that were happening. And uh, I, I feel like I have pretty accurately addressed those. However, I now have a whistleblower. That's right. I have someone who also works in the same hospital that Jody did. And I have more information on what was going on. But you're going to have to wait until the end of the video to be able to find out that information. Because before we do that, Project Veritas has released quite a few more videos since then. And we're going to catch up on them. And we're going to explain... Why all of this is a massive, massive nothing burger. Now, the second video that they put out was effectively a worker at the FDA, but he wasn't a scientist. He wasn't anybody who was involved in the upper runnings or business administration. He was an economist. And most of this footage is basically him having drinks and blowing off steam and expressing that he's very frustrated with the pandemic and unvaccinated people. And so he jokingly says things like, we need to vaccinate people via blow darts. I mean, my personal thing is like, you know, you get blow darts of J&J &J and again, I am a what little cynical. blow darts of j, &J? Yeah, Johnson Johnson. What do you mean? Like go to the unvaccinated, blow it into him, blow dart it into him. Yeah. That's, that's where I am at this point. Now, is that a dumb thing to say? Uh, it would be if you knew you are going to be recorded. But I'm pretty sure all of us have said plenty of things to people in, in mixed company that is just being hyperbolic. But also, this is just an economist at the FDA. This is not describing policy. So right off the bat, I'm not going to dive any deeper into it because honestly, trying to make this into a big thing, the FDA wants to blow dart vaccines into you. If anybody actually believes that, nothing I say is going to convince you otherwise. Anyway, episode three was a little bit more interesting. Meet scientist Justin Durant and regional business lead Brandon Schatt, officials with pharma giant Johnson & Johnson. So in part three, they secretly record conversations with a scientist and a business manager from Johnson & Johnson. We'll deal with the scientist first, and then we'll talk a little bit about the business manager. But the scientist says some interesting things, but I, I really want to play this for you. This is James O'Keefe claiming that he's going to say something. Listen to this. Justin Durant, scientist at Johnson & Johnson, is clear on one thing. Don't get this vaccine. But nowhere, and I mean nowhere in this video, does this scientist say that people should not get the vaccine. It just doesn't happen. The closest thing is when he says this. You really don't need to vaccinate. You don't need to vaccinate. It's in your, you take, especially if it's not going to school, it's not going, um, it's in your house. Now, is that the same thing as this? Justin Durant, scientist at Johnson & Johnson, is clear on one thing. Don't get this vaccine. No, it's not. And in fact, he also has a really important point here. Let's play it one more time. So at what age do you think people should? Once you go out and you have to go to preschool, and you're around kids I don't know how old Johnny down the block was doing. So that's when he goes down. His point is that maybe it's not necessary to vaccinate an infant because infants are probably not going to be leaving the house very much, especially during a pandemic. Probably not a very good idea. But once they're old enough that they need to start going to school and be exposed to more people, everybody knows that elementary schools, preschools even, 
are disease factories. If you've ever been a parent, if you've ever had a kid, you know exactly what that's like. One kid gets a cold, then all the kids get a cold, and all their parents get a cold. We all understand that. But he also talks about this. It's like that. If you want to go to a bar, you need to come in with a cold. That's like inconvenience these people so much. They're just like... And that can sometimes bother people because they don't like the idea that they should be compelled to do something they don't want to do. But that's kind of how you get anybody to do something that they don't want to do. You have to inconvenience them to the point that they want to get it more than they care about the reasons why they won't. Like, that's the basic idea behind compelling somebody. And you can try and make a claim that, like, that's manipulation, but that's just human interaction. But let's take a look at the business manager. So why is everyone leaning away from the Johnson & Johnson? It could be in part like an FU. I'm not going to get your vaccine if you're going to force me to do this. It right. could be too because people are still trusted. You know? But never Johnson & Johnson. Why though? 60% thing in the blood clots. This is really the only part of it that is interesting in regards to what he has to say because again he's not a scientist uh he is just a business manager we don't know when this clip was recorded there was a point in time where we had some very serious concerns about blood clots with the johnson and johnson vaccine it was incredibly rare but it was still a concern it was still something that we needed to keep an eye on and we also know more about it now the topic of blood clots when it comes to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has largely been blown out of proportion. It is something, of course, that has to be a concern, and I absolutely believe that it should be listed as a possible side effect no matter how rare. However, looking up the data on this, by May 9th, 9 million doses had been administered of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and the rare blood clot cases had grown to 28, six of them in men. But at that point, only three people had died. I did find another article where somebody recently in the state of Washington passed away. So we can assume that it's grown to about four. Now, does this give the Johnson & Johnson vaccine a pass? No, but it does showcase pretty much the worst case scenario that we know of so far that has been confirmed for any of the COVID-19 vaccines. And lastly, just for context, this possibly life-threatening clotting condition is known as venous thromboembolism. And while it is unfortunate that this might happen with a vaccine, it more commonly is caused by injuries or lack of movement in bedridden patients. And in fact, it can even be caused in some circumstances by medications like birth control pills. I mention this only to emphasize that it isn't singularly caused by this vaccine in rare cases. It is something that does occur and occur much, much more often in other situations. So what exactly was the issue? Was it before we knew that it was an incredibly rare thing? Was this recorded right around the time when this was making big news and he was concerned about people maybe getting messed up from it? Now we know better? We don't know. As with all of these secretly recorded conversations, Project Veritas does not give us the context. It does not give us any of the details. It just shows you something and it tells you what that conclusion should be, that they, they want you to get the conclusion that they want. Like, after all, what did James O'Keefe say? Justin Durant, scientist at Johnson & Johnson, is clear on one thing. Don't get this vaccine. Now, part four is also rather interesting. They're talking to a scientist who works at Pfizer. There are two central themes behind this video. One is that Pfizer is evil. Okay. Now, despite constant allegations that I am some sort of shill, I am by no means a huge fan of the pharmaceutical industry, and I can tell you right now that Pfizer has some very large problems. They, in fact, had to pay the largest healthcare fraud settlement in history of $2.3 billion. Largely, this is because the marketing of their product, they included some uh, off-label uses that were not approved by the FDA. And of course, while we can criticize Pfizer for some of their shady business practices, you have to understand that that doesn't mean that their drugs don't work. After all, they manufacture insulin. Insulin is not going to suddenly stop working because it's made by Pfizer. And then the second part is that a natural exposure 
to COVID-19 is better than getting vaccinated. And as with almost everything that has to do with pandemics and immunology, it's a lot more complicated than that. The question of whether natural immunity versus vaccinated is better is not yet answered. Studies are regularly coming out showing that while natural exposure confers some immunity, it may not last. Some suggesting it could last only three months. In one instance, a study found at five, six months post-vaccination or infection, the vaccinated participants had overall higher levels of neutralizing antibodies than the infected, including against variants. The one thing most experts agree on, however, is that getting vaccinated after natural exposure actually gives you the strongest protection of all. But there are two things that I really think we should focus on that he says in this video. Number one, I had COVID and I okay. have monster immunity yeah. after eight months. So I just got checked last month yeah. for antibodies. I mean, that's no worries. Same thing with my brother. So should I get the vaccine? Wait. Until so when? If your immunity starts to wane, then get vaccinated. That from his perspective, if you do have something of a natural immunity from an actual exposure that you can prove, well, your immunity can start to wane, and then you should probably get vaccinated. So again, this guy is not anti-vax. And the other is the topic of myocarditis, which is something that a lot of people have been talking about, and it is something worth getting into. But we're starting to kind of understand it a little bit better. One of the current theorized culprits for myocarditis following injection is method, not medicine. Vaccines are intramuscular injections. They aren't meant to go into a vein. Improper injection could be the source of the problem. However, even with it being a possible but very rare side effect, studies and statistics clearly show that your risk of myocarditis is six times higher from COVID than the vaccine. And even those who do get it, the condition is mild and short-lived. And then we get part five. Part five, we finally have another whistleblower. This time, it's a woman by the name of Melissa who worked at Pfizer as a quality auditor. Again, not a scientist, not anyone actually in the upper management, but a pretty low-level functionary position. But let's, let's try and understand what they're trying to tell us in this video. In this database, you came across a chain of emails discussing fetal tissue and the COVID vaccine. From the perspective of corporate affairs, we want to avoid having the information on the fetal cell lines floating out there. The sum totality of this video is that Melissa accessed internal emails from Pfizer and found them having a conversation between their legal team and some of their business team talking about how much they wanted to disclose freely, not that they were hiding, but disclose freely that there was in fact embryonic fetal sort of tissue used in the testing of vaccines. Now, this is very deceptively framed because they want you to believe that there are fetal cells from a human embryo in the vaccines. This is not true. They've used cells from aborted fetuses. Yes. And they don't cells. want the public to know that. Yes. All of this boils down to the usage of HEK 293T cells. HEK 293T, what does that mean? HEK. Uh, human embryo kidney cells, and okay. it was from experiment 293. And the history behind this cell line is pretty fascinating, but we've been using it for a very, very long time. HEK293T is a cell line. Cell lines are replicated tissue that can be produced for various applications. This one cell line in particular came from the kidney tissue from a fetus that was, yes, aborted back in 1973. The reasons they are so commonly used is because they are easily transfused with genes, and specifically the T variant because it contains the SV40 large T antigen, making it invaluable in studying immunology. Now, the Veritas video does mention this was used only in testing, although they muddy the language here and there. Did Pfizer make use of a cell line from an aborted fetus when carrying out any tests? This is after we'd already confirmed with the customer that no cell lines from an aborted fetus were used. In this database, you came across a chain of emails discussing fetal tissue and the COVID vaccine. Um, they're being so deceptive in their emails, it's almost like it is in the final vaccine. But they also make a plea that this violates religious exemptions, even if it is not in the vaccine itself. 
And they're denying our religious exemptions at Pfizer. And this could change that because people who have religious views, mm -hmm. that certainly changes the game, doesn't it? Yes. Famously, the Catholic Church, with the blessing of the Pope, decreed it was morally acceptable to receive these vaccines if no alternatives are available. Now, the documents in this video itself are largely talking about not volunteering the information. None of it is secret. In fact, anti-vaxxers have been screaming about this cell line for well over a decade. Nothing Melissa reveals is new. It's simply some bigwigs trying to avoid a moral panic, something Project Veritas intentionally creates with this video. But also, they have to throw in there some of the most egregious self-suck kind of attitude just to, to bolster up their image some more. Uh, just, just listen to this. Uh, and why didn't you go to the New York Times or uh, the Washington Post? Well, I've spoken to lawyers. Uh, I've spoken to people, and this is what I was told to do, was to trust Project Veritas and to go with you guys by lawmakers, by lawyers. Really? Mm -hmm. Whistleblower lawyers told me that some things are better leaked to the media than doing it the other way. I think this just needs to get out there so that people can realize we're being deceived. Oh, is that why you went to Project Veritas? Is it? Could it not maybe be for another reason? As a quick aside, I actually had to go through the Internet Archive to find this because they have now hidden donations. And the last time I saw before they did so, it was over $400,000. Coincidentally enough, the very first whistleblower that Project Veritas talked to, her gives and go is also now not showing how much she's raised. Odd. Kind of interesting how, uh, you know, you and you and Jody both seem to have gotten quite a quite a big paycheck out of this whole situation. All right. Now, speaking of Jody, though, we need to finally get to the end point of this video because it's true. I did get my own whistleblower. Somebody contacted me out of the blue after my last Project Veritas video. They work in the same hospital as Jody. Now, to understand what we're going to get into, we also need to take a look a little bit at some of the claims that Jody made first in Project Veritas episode one, but also on an appearance that she made on the Charlie Kirk show. And then we can hear from my whistleblower, somebody who has no financial incentive in order to be coming forward, as opposed to Jody, who does. Okay, let's start with what Jody O'Malley claimed was her impetus for blowing the whistle. She didn't want to take it. She didn't want to take it because of her religious beliefs. Now, now, now we're just making people take it and then there's reactions to it. But then she claims this on Charlie Kirk's show. I might not be remembering this correctly, Jody, but you said that one of your peers wanted to get a religious exemption for the vaccine, but she didn't. Can you talk about that, that part of the video? The, her and along with two other employees um, were coerced um, to take it. It was like, come on, take it, take it, you know. And then two weeks later, she comes in with a positive COVID and four days later, she's intubated. Now, I hope she survived because intubation is a serious. She did not. Oh, so she did not. She passed away later. So she, as a fully vaccinated nurse, passed away. She was not what they deemed fully vaccinated. She received her vaccine. Two weeks later, she's in the hospital when she was due for her second one, um, came down with um, her body just went crazy, um, you know, inflamed everywhere. And um, no, she did not make it. So she would be considered a vaccine um, injury. So first, her coworker dies of the vaccine. Now the claim is that the vaccine gave her COVID. And remember, she says she only had one shot. But then Jody's text messages tell a different story. Fuck COVID. I hate this. I wish it would go away. I'm so done losing people due to this fucked up virus. My friend was fully vaccinated. No underlying issues and got COVID and is gone now. I know, sweetie. I'm over this shit as well. I'm sorry to hear about your loss. What? Oh, my God. She was an ICU nurse working with COVID patients, so I'm sure that's where she got it, but fuck. So she got COVID from COVID patients? I thought she got COVID from the vaccine. Or rather, she died from the vaccine. Which, which is it, Jody? 
And according to the caption she gave when she published those messages, she was mostly concerned that she didn't receive ivermectin. There are some huge discrepancies here. And she says this on Charlie's show. All I did was show the truth. I didn't diagnose anybody. I didn't make anything up. All I did was record what was happening. But that's not true either, is it? You've made three different claims as to what happened to your coworker. But what is also concerning is Jody made strong claims that people in her hospital aren't reporting adverse reactions. This is where my whistleblower comes in. The coworker she's talking about passed away due to COVID, not the vaccine. Also, we all received an email on 9-30-2020 about VAERS reporting. She also claims the vaccine was the reason for the death of a coworker. However, that's not true. She says in her Instagram page that she was trying to get a medication with a coworker, doesn't directly say what medication it is, but references it. Well, if said coworker was having an adverse reaction to the vaccine, why would she want as a nurse to treat that person with said medication? We all have the duty to report adverse reactions. It's not a one-person thing. And there was no official whistleblower claim placed on file. But also, here's Jody's own words again. And you do see it. You don't have the time to do it. It takes 30 minutes to do that. And it's a a lot of documents, a lot of paperwork that you got to pull into that system. Well, then why didn't you report it, Jody? Again, from my whistleblower who is medical staff and works at the same hospital that Jody did. What boggles my mind is she's only giving one example of a possible adverse reaction, yet she claims she's seen dozens. We all have to report adverse reactions. It's not one specific person's job responsibility. Maybe during her shift, she and her coworkers didn't, but that doesn't speak for the whole hospital. There will be an investigation based on her claim. There are many current employees who it doesn't sit well that she recorded without consent. And this helpful source also provided the company email that was widely shared almost an entire year before she went to Veritas. Subject, how to report suspected vaccine-related adverse events. Sent Wednesday, September 30th, 2020. Good day. The purpose of this message is to review the importance of and procedure for reporting suspected adverse events related to vaccine administration. The Indian Health Manual, and in some cases, federal law, requires healthcare workers to report adverse events to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, VAERS. Please review the attached presentation that provides guidance on documenting and reporting adverse vaccine events. More information about reporting adverse drug events can be found on the IHS MPTC Pharmacovigilance website at... Please feel free to contact me with any questions you may have related to medication safety and adverse event reporting. Thank you and have a great day. Now remember, this is what Jody claimed. Is there a policy at the hospital for reporting these complications? No. There has never been any directive sent out on reporting. And that was a lie. A very, very profitable lie. All right, last but not least, I really, I really need to point this out. To encapsulate this whole issue with Project Veritas, and specifically James O'Keefe, because let's be honest, he is Project Veritas. Listen to this. Um, you're raising a quarter million dollars, not that you did this for that purpose. Right. But um, it's going to inspire a lot more people to come out because they know, like Andrew Breitbart, our mentor, my mentor said, if you run towards the fire, you inspire other people that they too can do it too. In this case, running into the fire can be uh, putting the public health at risk, prolonging a pandemic, uh, encouraging people to effectively self-harm behavior, that kind of thing. Using these deceptive tactics in order to very carefully edit footage or to frame things in a way that people are not even actually saying, in order to push a pro-disease, death cult-like narrative to happily march people into the fire... Because again, and I keep saying this, I keep hammering it into people's heads as much as I possibly can. Whether you live or die, you can be politically valuable to anti-vaxxers, specifically in the way that they are waging their politics right now. You are valuable, alive or dead. Sometimes more, dead, depending on how they're going to frame it. These people do not care about you. And when I say this, I'm not saying it as a way of me trying to say, don't listen to Project Veritas and listen to me. Uh, I'm a debunker. 
I am not somebody who is an expert. I'm not a. I'm not able to give you the the proper kind of guidance that you might need to fight against this. That's not my job. My job is to poke holes in the arguments of people trying to convince you of stuff. That's my job. When I have to cite something, I smite, I cite people way smarter than me, experts in their field. That's not me telling you these things. This is me giving you something to make you stop and pause and consider that maybe something somebody's trying to feed you might be poison. Which is ironic, because... A lot of times, some of the pseudoscience stuff that I fight against is actually literally poisonous. <laughs> but I really need to make sure that you understand Project Veritas is, for political reasons, regurgitating and reusing the same tactics that have been used by anti-vaxxers for decades. They are not interested in the truth. They're interested in pushing messaging. That's what it's for. To scare you and to make you believe what they want you to believe. Anyway, that's going to be it for me today, guys. I am <laughs> very tired. This is the third time I have tried to record this video. I had a lot of technical problems uh, prior to this. Thankfully, now it should be done, if you're seeing this out there in the world. Uh, it took far too much work, and all of the work that I had done prior to this point was a waste of time. Um, it can be a little bit of a thankless job sometimes, especially considering the view counts of things like Project Veritas. And uh, all I can hope is that somewhere out there, you know, maybe, maybe even one, maybe a handful of people, if I'm lucky, maybe more, can be right on the edge of maybe believing this kind of stuff. And I can give them a reason to take a pause and to consider that maybe what they're hearing is wrong and then look into it deeper towards people who actually know what they're talking about. That's my hope. That's my wish. If you'd like to, uh, you can always support the channel in various different ways. I've got links down below. Uh, make sure you check out some of my other projects that I do. And uh, check out my TikTok. I've been really busy on TikTok. Anyway, from my family to yours, I hope you're well. I hope they are well. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.